Uh, it's very good to see you uh, come up very early in the morning. It's, it's quite chilly, 9 o'clock in the morning. It takes some effort to come in, so thank you for that. Um, this workshop, uh, workshop number 195, will look at um, how do we move in empowering children uh, in the digital era. So um, we have a mix of panelists here. We will have a very interesting session to follow with the participation of uh, young people, as well as from very experienced um, pan panelists that we have amongst us. My name is Anjan Bose, and I'm from ECPAT International. I, and I represent uh, the interest of seven, uh, networks, members of 75 countries who are working uh, to combat sexual exploitation of children on, um, you know, globally. Um, I have to say I'm really honored to be the moderator uh, of this session, and it's really challenging to guide uh, our very distinguished young candidates here who have shown remarkable uh, skills, uh, confidence, and experience over the last few years, and uh, the amount of youthfulness, uh, exuberance, and um, you know, new things that they bring uh, to this forum is really remarkable. Um, the, what we will try to achieve um, through the rest of the session, uh, which will cover about 90 minutes, is to um, explore um, what we had already started over the other few days. You know, we have listened to uh, them, to others, to adults, about how the internet uh, is shaping up um, things. It's connecting worlds. It's enhancing our belief, giving us new tools, and how the society uh, responds to these challenges. Um, we will try to define uh, what uh, citizenship means in this digital era. Um, as we know, uh, internet has given us um, enormous possibilities. Uh, it has connected uh, the world. Uh, but if we go back um, to you know, some of the core concepts, the core foundations of uh, humanity, how uh, the basic values, um, how uh, the you know um, how we interact, how we um, react to certain things that we see around us, um, has been uh, standardized uh, in, in in the context of the uh, the human rights and child child rights and the treaty bodies that we have. And there is some acceptance. Uh, there is some um, you know general principles that everybody adhere to. And it's the basic rights and the duty of the states uh, to make sure that those principles that are enshrined uh, in these treaties are uh, implemented uh, in, in their countries, in their region. But what Internet has done is it has provided us with opportunities. At the same time, it has allowed uh, citizens of one country to be participating, uh, influencing, and even observing you know, what's going on in other countries that influences their own behavior. And these are not governed by the national legislations, the national norms of the country itself. And how do we move uh, with the internet growing and expanding? Um, is it the duty of the educators? Is it the duty of the family? Is it the duty of the states? Or more fundamentally, how much ownership does the technology industry take in the services that they provide? And because this, <coughs> the multinational nature of these companies impact how their services are perceived, used, and impact the life of people everywhere in the world. So what we'll try to do in the next uh, hour and a half is to listen to uh, you know what our very experienced young people have to say and I am again I have to say I'm really honored to be listening and um, kind of guiding the discussions here uh, so without further ado I would um, let our young spe people speak about what do they think about uh, citizenship in the digital era and how do they want um, things around them uh, to shape up as we move along. I will start with um, Luca. Um, Luca, 
I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. It's Luca Kylesbeck, is that correct? Yeah, that's all right. Uh, thank you. And he's from Denmark, and he will start our session. I'll pass on the floor to you, Luca. Thank you. Uh, my name is Luca. I'm 14 years old, and I'm from Denmark. I'm a youth panelist who represents in AXO. Um, in my spare time, I play a lot of music for myself and with my band. Um, for me, I do not only use the internet for fun, but also for some serious things. I used to uh, use the internet to promote my band's music and um, so we could get out in the world uh, via the internet. And um, mostly I used the internet for my um, homework, for my schedule and for information about projects. My opinion is that um, when I have an opinion I can easily just share it with others. I often use my music to express my opinions online and online I can reach a lot of people and, when, and we can sort of discuss different issues. I think the theme of today is a bit strange. I mean, citizenship in a digital era, um, it sounds so adultish. Sometimes I'm a citizen with a lot of opinions about a lot of things, but um, mostly I'm just online doing stuff where I'm not especially participating in any way, other way than gaming or watching movies. Of course, um, that can give me some background in being a citizen all in all, but it's mostly just for fun, for relaxing, sorry. If a situation pops up at Facebook or on other social media, we, we, we do not tackle the problem differently than if it was a problem in the schoolyard. <laughs> we take the problem up with the teacher and talk about why and how we should solve it. If, we, if it was in situation online, we would also take it up with the teacher or your parents and talk about why and how we could solve it again. So mostly there's no difference to online and offline situation handling. For me, there's no difference, I'm the same person online and offline, because I do not think there's no difference between online and offline worlds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Luca, I think you raised a very important point that probably will be deliberated uh, again when we come back to the Q&A session, uh, that for you, there is no distinction between online and offline world. Things that you do online can be solved or taken to the offline world, or things that you do offline can be shared or has implications in the online world. We'll come back to that. And I think that's a very good statement that you have made. Uh, can I move on to our next young panelist, Olivia? Uh, she's Olivia Bangbrink. Uh, if, again, please excuse me, pardon me, if I'm not pronouncing your last name correctly. And she's also the youth member from Denmark. Over to you, Olivia. Um, hello, my name is Olivia and I'm 13 years old and come from Denmark. I'm a youth panelist from Inaxo and in my spare time I play football both with my own team and I'm coach for some small girls. I use most of the internet to social medias, watching videos, homework, research, music, news and football news. I don't think it's always a good idea to set up folders for children. In some incidents, of course it's fine, as a good idea, or maybe, you know, when your children are four or nine or something like that. But when you're older, you don't want to have any limits. You just want to make mistakes and learn from all the mistakes you make. Because it's, never, it's better to learn from a mistake than never found out how it is because your parents are scared. And by the way, some parents think they can protect their children from everything they don't like but everyone has to find out how the world is sooner or later. And it's better to be well equipped than totally lost when you have to go out to the big online world. And it's better to start seeing the reality when you're 13 than 18. If you see, exactly when, like when you see a video with one of your friends, maybe about war, and then you come, come home and you want to see it, but you can't because your parents set up a folder you feel like they will hide a part of the world for you. My parents haven't set any folders up for me because they want me to find out how the online world works. But when I was smaller, my mother followed what I did on Facebook because I got Facebook before I was 13. Um, so when somebody she didn't know commented on my status or something, she asked, who is that and where do you know her from and stuff like that. But now, she don't follow me, but she, she just accepts, she just uh, expect that I, not, I don't want to hurt anybody and I don't 
and I do good things and I don't want to hurt anything in what I'm saying. Um, I mean, but she is always uh, ready to help me if I make some bad stuff or someone is doing something against me. And remember, there is a very big difference between being 4 and 13. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Olivia. And uh, can I just um, highlight one thing that you said? Uh, what I gather from your statement is you want unfettered, unfiltered access to the internet. Everything that's out there, including good and bad things, so that you can experiment, you can try and learn from that. That's what I gather from your statement, right? Yeah. And you, you have said that you also have your mom, your family, uh, to, to kind of give you guidance if required. You know, there, there would be someone that you would revert to, right? Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, moving on, um, I have from the local context from Azerbaijan, uh, we have um, uh, Fidan, uh, Fidan Karimli. Um, uh, she's from uh, the NUR, the NUR project. Uh, I would pass on the floor to you, uh, Fidan. Um, good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to welcome you all to Azerbaijan. As I come from Azerbaijan, I'm a panelist from NUR Children and Youth Public Union, which is uh, children and public, uh, youth NGO functioning in Azerbaijan for the last 15 years. And I would like to say that uh, I am very much honored that we are hosting this forum, uh, this important and essential forum. And I am very happy to have you all here, uh, despite the fact that it takes me 15 minutes more to go to college because of traffic. Um, I, I know that the time is limited. I actually had um, a lot of stuff to say, but I want to um, I want to uh, to to bring my approach to the situation and to tell how the uh, the the community of Azerbaijan is facing the uh, and dealing with the child safety uh, uh, internet safety issues. Um, back back. And seven years ago, back when I was in school, uh, I was the only kid in my school who had a computer. And all the kids from my school would come to my house just to use the computer. And it was like a second PlayStation for, uh, for them, basically. And I had no one uh, at home to advise me how to use a computer, how to use internet. And that was the major problem. And I think that being a child, I wasn't able to efficiently use the internet tools, uh, the, the broad um, opportunities that internet might have gave me. And um, but uh, now the ch situation is different. Even I can say that my mom now is an active internet user. She shops online, and like uh, recently, she came to me and saying, "Hey, I got an email saying that uh, I won a lo lottery of one million dollar. Can you give me the credit number?" The, the, the number of the credit card and I was like mom you've been fooled <laughs> and I I just uh, imagine if back then the same thing happened to me and I was the one to enter the credit card uh, number I would have uh, major problems with my family uh, the, I can say that the same situ the situation haven't changed much, but uh, back then in school, if we had five computers in the whole school and had no access to it, uh, now it's different. Now the, all the schools are equipped with computers, with uh, it has access to internet and also the privacy and uh, and. Uh, the 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 internet sessions the children take in school is assured their privacy is assured in uh, in the sessions but not at home children don't have a person to assist their uh, the, the the time in the internet they don't have anyone that basically because their parents their caregivers the teachers even the teachers lack the skills the necessary skills to uh, uh, um, to use of online tools. Basically, as, a, uh, as I started social work from, from very early ages, I was lucky enough uh, to know after 
12, uh, at the age of 12, how to use internet properly and to get the information that I needed, the, the important thing, uh, things. Um, and I wish that uh, more children had this, uh, had the same chance. But not everyone is involved to social activities. Uh, they're not civil uh, or to civil engagement. And uh, the civil, uh, the civil society, the civil, uh, the social workers are are people to strive this. Uh, uh, we have uh, within our projects, we have we have gone to many uh, many schools to teachers. We had uh, training sessions for teachers. I myself have been at age of 14, have been a peer educator to children at schools, uh, basically going to them and uh, and telling what you should do online, what sh you should not be doing online, and that is important. This action should be continue. Uh, you know that globally we're facing the budget cuts and social workers, it's hard every year for us to work, but this shouldn't be start. This is a, um, a multi-stakeholder approach should be uh, uh, approach should be taken in this situation. It's not that only governments or some government institutions or structures have to deal with it. It's the pro uh, it's contains everyone, the, the parents, the, the caregivers together because it's not only the technical support that children need, it's they need someone to advise, to communicate. It takes more than just uh, policies and uh, documents or technical support. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Fidan. Um, quite a few different issues that you have raised. Um, the one that strikes me um, is uh, you know, the holistic approach, you said that it's not only technical, it's not only policy, it has to come down to practicing level, you know, it has to be implemented in real life uh, that touches you, that touches every part of, uh, you know, the services that we are, um, you know, that impacts us. The other thing that I would like to highlight is when you mentioned, when you started off saying, uh, you know, as we are empowering children uh, and young people, um, our family, our adult society also needs education. They are also using internet. Uh, empowering um, is a common term. We shouldn't only restrict it to young people. But having said that, there are values that your uh, you know, f parents have acquired over years of experience, uh, over the, re you know, the physical world that we have lived. And some of them apply to the online world. And this needs to be, you know, kind of, um, um, absorbed uh, in, in, in the culture that we are bringing to the online session as well. So just a thought that it, it's both ways. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we will come back to your points as we open up the floor. Uh, next young speaker is uh, Matthew Jackman from UK. And uh, he has uh, shown um, us, all of us, a number of uh, uh, panels that he has chaired, that he's quite capable of leading this workshop too. So I look forward to, uh, to hearing from you. Well, thank you very much. That's extremely generous. And thank you very much for inviting both Rebecca and I. I think, I think Rebecca and I are both going to speak and kind of present together okay. um, so, in this case. So, uh, yeah, um, um, uh, I, my apologies for not oh, introducing fine. Rebecca because I was thinking you are taking turns. Uh, but um, Rebecca is also from uh, Rebecca Cawthorn. Uh, she's also from the UK. And she will be joining Matthew in presenting their thoughts about digital citizenship or citizenship in the digital era, however we define it. Mm, fantastic, yeah. So I guess it's our job to kind of look at digital citizenship from a youth perspective and kind of say what it means to us and what we think the term means in the digital era in relation to industry, education and all these things which kind of apply to the internet itself. I think I'll start by saying it's very interesting what Lucas said at the start there that to him digital citizenship is quite an adult term. It's quite the opposite to me. I think I'm very fortunate, you know, I'm at the IGF, I understand these, these kind of issues, I'm very fortunate to have talked about them and discussed them early in the week in different panels, but I think the term in itself is, is, is right, and it, there is an importance that it has the word digital in, in the kind of title and how we class this. I mean, digital citizenship suggests this net etiquette which we talk about, being good online, and how we all have to respond to each other and we all respect that online we're all with each other. I think 
the relevance of digital citizenship in the modern era is extremely prevalent um, and that we have to recognize that there is a distinction between how we behave offline and how we uh, behave online. Um, it's interesting, we, we, we carried out a survey at ChildNet um, which really highlighted that human behavior online and offline varies. Um, and obviously everyone's different. I mean, Luke, I mean, people were saying just further down on the, uh, on the panel that they see the online and offline world as the same thing. But, you know, everyone's different and people will have different behaviors online. Um, I think, obviously, the internet is providing things which offline is just in, are impractical and you can't achieve, um, you know, for example, I'll take an example, for, uh, being anonymous online is something that which is really hard to achieve offline, but online is much more you know, accessible. And this really changes how humans act online and how digital citizenships, how we all as a community respond to different things on and offline. So being anonymous, people will act differently. They will, they will make judgment. They will see things in different lights. I think it's important that digital citizenship is taught and that these behaviours are identified and are really enhanced. I mean, we, we talk about empowering children and how we need to kind of bring out the best in the internet and how the community has to work together. And I think understanding that human behaviour is different in the two worlds is crucial to that. And that stems from education. And, and I think, Becky, you want to say some things on education? Instead? Yeah, in schools in England, at least, we get taught about um, citizenship in the real world we get taught about how to behave and I think that's why we like the term digital citizenship. Digital citizenship is just an extension of that. There are different challenges online that, than there are offline so it is important that it's taught as a separate matter but spear spearing off the same thing really. Um, I mean I think someone down there mentioned that they thought that it was good to make mistakes online that you don't need to be blocked from making these mistakes but I think the education side of citizenship, I mean, it'll stop you talking to strangers offline, which, I mean, is a different issue online, of course, but you need to be educated about this so you don't make the mistakes, as you were saying as well, not putting your credit card details in. That's the kind of thing that you don't want to be making those mistakes. You want to learn about them beforehand, and then you can actually actively choose if you want to make that mistake or not. And we're thinking about how to bring out the best in the internet and how because we're obviously here to discuss digital citizenship in the modern era. We all want to be citizens. We all want to be doing good. We want to have this good net etiquette. But the thing it kind of boils down for me is education and how we as a community achieve digital citizenship in the modern era, where the roles and responsibilities lie with industry, ourselves, and education. Um, if, I take, if I start with education, I think education has to change. It has to be progressive. And as technology changes, so does education. As people's behavior changes with the new technology, education has to change and kind of catch up. In our survey we took, um, we found that actually 62% of respondents said that the schools were, the, were the, where they wanted to be taught about the internet and about being a citizen online. But, I mean, that does already happen in a lot of schools. I think it was 40 to 50% of the people who took our survey said they had already been taught somewhat about digital citizenship. We just need to catch up the rest of the people to fit the already high standard that is happening. But, but as well as schools teaching, people, because it was a, a multi-choice, uh, kind of not cumulative um, survey question where there were many different answers, schools was the top answer. Education where, was where children wanted to find out how to be taught about being the best citizens they can online. But also they found parents, as was mentioned around there, how parents look after you, how parents lead you through the internet. Even though we might be the digital natives, we might have grown up with internet and not known a time when there's been no internet. Parents still have that responsibility as parental well, with parental guidance to care for you online as well as offline. As do the service providers, we we think kids, as Jack, uh, Matthew was saying, sorry, um, as Matthew was saying, there are changes happening, and education needs to keep up with that. But it's the role of the service providers to keep us informed of these changes so that we can educate about them. Interestingly, serv service providers were 48% of respondents. That's where they wanted to learn, as in the roles of the uh, internet or the service providers and how their websites cater for being good, or be, I don't want to say being good online, but respecting others online and being the community and being aware of others around you. Um, and, and finally, I think it was interesting in previous workshops um, in which I've been listening and people were saying, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all well and good that, you know, internet providers, education change and, and they become better and stronger and, and they recognize these things. 
but it's it's our responsibility it's the people who are learning it's the people who want to be taught as well we we can't just sit back and say well it's you know it's, it's their right it was their responsibility you know we're innocent in a sense um i think the quote i heard was kind of peer uh, moderation and self-awareness has been said a lot. Understanding who we are online and how we need to understand digital yeah. citizenship as well. We have quite a large role in this. I mean, people who are learning about digital citizenship need to ha start informing other people about it. They need to teach, as you were saying, peer moderation. You need to be able to say, okay, I've learned this online. You need to also learn this. You need to know what to do and what not to do to inform other people so you can make sure that everyone is making the right choices or if they are making um, mistakes, to help educate them about how they can correct that. Mm. And I think with what we've mentioned here, it, it became apparent in previously in the week and, and even more so every time I think about it that achieving the best kind of internet, the, the f most community aware internet has to be this partnership between the three stakeholders which you've mentioned so the education the industry and ourselves um, not just youth as was mentioned this is this is everyone online um, digital, citizenship, di digital citizenship applies to everyone and it's it's everyone everyone's awareness which contributes to everyone else and that's I think what we wanted to get across now that yeah. you know we, we accept that online people are different behaviors are different but fundamentally everyone has to work together that those behaviors are you know accepted and everyone can almost express online almost, as they want to almost as if a best practice should be set i mean it, i'm not saying this is just an idea uh, probably a very idealistic view that if there is a set of be best practice that people can you know try and work towards that i mean it'd take a, ver a lot of work and everything but i mean it just needs to be something that people think oh, okay i won't say something like that online because I know that would harm other people. That's kind of part of being a good global ci uh, digital citizen as it is to be a good citizen in the real world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, it's getting interesting. It's really getting interesting in the sense that um, we have um, started with saying that there is no online and offline world, but here we are coming back to the need for uh, the distinct online um, you know, knowing what online world is. Now, uh, what I've sensed from uh, you too, Matthew and Rebecca, is that um, there is a, you know, because of the anonymity, the pers I would say perceived anonymity, that people behave differently online, uh, that they wouldn't probably do on offline. And do you think, I mean, this is again a question that I'll come back to, is whether we should be making an effort to make sure that we should not have uh, the, the sense that we can behave something differently because of the perceived anonymity that is offered online. Um, and it's okay to be, you know, doing something because it's an online world. And um, whether we should make conscious effort to, to make people understand that it's, uh, it's citizenship after all. And what the industry can do to, you know, to make sure that, or not only industry, everybody, uh, to make sure that we really don't need to behave differently off online. Um, it it c probably came down from a starting point where the anonymity was a big issue, where people took advantage of that. But it's no longer there. So why do we keep trying to, you know, differentiate these two? Why can't we bring the citizenship factor universally? Uh, this is something that we may have to touch base uh, later on. Thank you very much. Um, and you have given enough thought, uh, food for thought, for our uh, audience here to come back to you. Uh, I move on to um, a Q&A session. I open up the floor because what we will do is we have finished. She's... Uh, uh, I will come back. I will treat her as an adult participant. Serving is uh, our adult representative here. So I'm putting her in the next slot. Um, we have already heard uh, different sort of views from our young people here, uh, ranging from uh, their need to go online on a regular basis for communications, for exchanging information, for entertainment. We have seen that you know, they feel that resilience is a big factor that will allow them to you know, learn things as they go. And we also have learned that uh, you know it's a responsibility as well as as you go online. You, uh, which um, Larry pointed out quite correctly um, in a couple of sessions earlier, uh, that with uh, power comes responsibility. 
So when you have power to do something, when you assume, uh, you know, you need to have show responsibility as well. And that applies to the private sector too, uh, to the um, service providers. Uh, so with that, I, I would uh, take questions from the floor, starting with Anne. Please introduce yourself briefly when you uh, make your intervention. hear me? No? Can you hear me? Okay. I'm Ann Collier with ConnectSafely.org. Um, um, I wanted to, a couple things really interested me. Um, well, actually, there was a major highlight from everything that everybody said, but just to zoom in on a couple. Um, Luca, I thought it was so interesting that you made um, you make no distinction between online and offline, and I think kind of that's the way the world is going. Um, but what really struck me about what you said is that the solutions um, also are no distinction. You know, I think what we hear so much is, you know, get the service provider to do more to fix, you know, the arguments between young people or adults, right? And yet, the context of that argument is real life it you know for kids it's school life so that's where the solution generally is so that really struck me thank you and then Olivia I had a question for you um, you said at the very end that there's a, a big difference between being four and being 14 or 13 and of course there is um, are you suggesting in saying that that the online safety messaging has been kind of juvenile, that it, it sort of, well, what I mean is that, sorry, that, do you think that the, 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 the online safety education or instruction has been sort of treating 13-year-olds like four-year-olds? Because 13-year-olds, generally speaking, know more than the online safety field um, imagines. Does that make sense? Yeah, pretty much. Um, um, sometimes, uh, I was the session, I think, in Tuesday or something, um, a man said that uh, he has a four-year-old girl set up a folder, and uh, he wants to set up folders for her until, he was eight, uh, until she was 18, um, because he wanted to protect her. Uh, against everything bad on the internet, um, and he, he, um, and that is what I th what I'm meaning. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea because when so he she is um, 18 and he take up every folders, um, it will come like a shock for her. Everything she has protected for her entire life will slash her, slap her in her face um, because. He, um, but if he exactly maybe took some of the filters away when he, she was 13 and one more when and a little bit more when she was 16 and then she would be more equipped when she was 18 and that is what I'm meaning. So it's not so much the... Uh, can I say it again? Yeah, yeah, so it's not so much the education... Can you hear me? Can you hear me? It's not so much the education as the protection. That, that it's more you're talking about how parents, because they're so afraid, are treating their children. They're overprotecting. You're not talking about online safety education in school or something, right? Um, I think um, when you're beginning to be older, you should educate more and more and more. But, um, yeah, I think it's more about how parents will overreact about how the internet is. Because when they were a child, um, there was not the, the internet was not the same then and that as it is now. So, yeah. they don't know how it is. 
So they are a react. Yeah, I think. And they have to learn how it is now, and that is what I'm trying to say. Yes, uh, I, I think uh, you know I um, I'm trying to make it a bit more clear for all of you that uh, apart from the protection um, methodologies that differs when you are four and thirteen, the educational messaging that you give two people are different when you are at four and when you are at 13. And uh, one size doesn't really fit all. Uh, that's what, basically, what you wanted to say. And I think Olivia also agrees with that, I, I guess, that, you know, w w do you think that the, not the protection, not the filters that you are, you know, the information that you are allowed to access, but also, um, you know, what you are taught when you are 14 and when you are like 13, 14, should not be in the same vein, right? I mean, it should not be the same type of material. You need different type of um, uh, in information and education from your parents when you grow up. That's what you also agree with. Yeah. Thank you very much. Is there any other question, comments from the floor? Yes, Jim. Yeah, hi, uh, Jim Prendergast with the Galway Strategy. Can you guys hear? OK. Um, I was lucky enough to moderate a panel earlier in the week that many of you participated in. I want to thank you for that. Um, knowing that learning about this stuff is not limited to one source. So you, you learn it from peers, you learn it from your parents, you learn it from making mistakes. Um, what do you guys consider some of the best sources for best practices, what you should and should not do? Uh, when it comes to learning about life online, whether it be, you know, we call it citizenship or, you know, what you're going about through your, your daily experiences in the online world. So do you want um, all of them to respond or anyone? It's a, it's a Any, anyone. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> okay. So who would like to go first? Luca, you want to go first on that? Okay. I think that, uh, I think uh, you should maybe, I think the best way you learn is from your parents, but also much from your friends or from your mistakes, I guess, is the best for me, I guess. Um, so from your parents and your friends and mistakes is the best way. Anybody else? Yes, for them. Um, <coughs> well, here in Azerbaijan, um, Microsoft Azerbaijan developed a manual, a special manual. That's the basic, uh, that's the main, uh, main source that we use. Uh, and other than that, I'd say personal practices. I mean, I guess I'm pretty fortunate. Um, my parents understand the internet. They know and they were able to educate me about how to be safe online and things like that. But I think, I mean, a lot of my friends don't have that. Their parents don't understand. They go on the internet to do emails and that's about it. So they obviously don't understand, you know, the security of Facebook because they don't have a profile themselves. I think in that case, it's better to... Well, I think in some ways school education is very good for that kind of thing. You can find out about about how to put a privacy setting on, how to know if your profile's open, things like that. But another way is friends, like if I add someone on Facebook who is one of my friends and I've noticed when I'm adding them that their profile is completely open or they've been posting something that I know they're not meant to be posting, then I will actually approach them and say, look, you know, you probably need to put a better better uh, pro privacy settings because I could see everything and then that kind of thing I think is really helpful and that was what helps me as well. Uh, yes, Matthew, quickly. I think I have two answers for you there. Um, <laughs> I think the one I see and the one that I'm used to which I think is the best is education. Um, obviously I, my school is connected with Chardonnay and they come in and they talk to us and they explain issues like this and that's extremely useful. But I think the answer I'd like to give you is that it's internet providers which are caring for their users online. And that, that's for everyone. That doesn't have to be just their protecting youth users. As, as Olivia said, we, do, we don't want to be shut off from, from the adult world. We don't want to be getting slapped in the face when it gets to 18, as she put it. But it has to be internet providers which are really showing us, before, before we make mistakes, what, this is, what, what citizenship is about. I would like to go onto the internet and find that online I am being shown what to do. I mean, people aren't going to always have good friends, good schools, and, you know, these other alternatives which we're fortunate, fortunate enough to have, 
So the internet has to be the first, if, if they're accessing the internet for the first time, that has to be the first place they know what digital, digital, digital citizenship is. And that, I believe, should be developed and would be the be best practice to put in place. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew. And I'll quickly take, uh, um, please be quick. Yeah. It's just a really quick point. I mean, um, we're all focusing on that it's digital citizenship for children, but I mean, this education needs to be ad for adults as well. A lot of them don't know the best practice online, and some adults are even worse at being a good digital citi citizen than we are. So I think the education needs to be for everyone, not just for young people. Yeah, and uh, Olivia? Um, yeah. I think it's um, pretty, m pretty much um, there's. It's about many uh, will uh, educate you, like um, your parents, your school, your mistakes, um, your friends, and everything. But um, I miss some some a kind of education in my school, like um, m take a little time and talk about how to behave on the internet with all of your friends, because so then you know where they, what they like, and what they don't like. And you can tell them what you like. And you can talk about um, how you want the song to be, because it's probably some of your friends in the school you will talk to on the internet. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, just one point that I would like to make personally and in this issue, we have learned from various you know, responses that everybody has a role to play in terms of education. But I, you know, it's very obvious that the, the information, the skills or the knowledge that you gain from each sector is different. Your parents will inform you, educate you in a different way. Uh, but to get towards safety, towards protection, uh, the, you know, your friends will give you advice probably as um, uh, Rebecca mentioned, you know, more technical in terms of the tools that you are actually using. So the level of support, guidance and knowledge you get from each sector differs. And what uh, very importantly what Matthew mentioned was the support from the industry. They're not the best the best place to give a holistic, you know, they, they can give you, they can guide you with all the information, uh, uh, which is absolutely crucial, and not for the sake of just putting it on the website, uh, to make a conscious effort to make it available, accessible, and make sure that people who are using the services know about this, to start with, and not just for regulatory, you know, for obligatory reasons, but to make them more visible and it captures all the essence that comes from the different stakeholders we mentioned before that it's not only technical it's not only uh, you know how to behave online uh, so it, it, it i just wanted to flag that that you cannot expect the same kind of guidance information from all sectors um, any other question comments from the floor for our young panelists anything from the remote participants no nothing yet so I guess they have managed to press on their idea, have managed to pass on their idea to, to all of us here. And we do agree, we are in conformity with uh, what they have said, that um, you know, um, moving forward, it's a collective responsibility. Yes, uh, Victor, uh, is, is that correct? Thank you. Um, where is the microphone? Can you hear me? Okay. It's just a short question, but is it so important to uh, specify who's doing the educating? Isn't it uh, okay that you get the education from several sources? Uh, I, it just seem, it seems to me like you're trying to narrow down who's doing the educating, but shouldn't you be shouldn't it be a cross uh, teamwork between like the service providers, the parents, uh, peer pressure, the school, um, yeah, something like that? Oh, any, anybody in particular or to all of them? It was, it was just directed at the panel. Okay. Um, I personally think that all the, all, all the guidances or manuals should be developed jointly um, uh, in partnership with, with many stakeholders, parents, uh, companies, social workers, educators, it should be developed to, together. 
I think that's exactly what we were saying. We were saying that we wanted, you know, the widespread of places where we could, all, as you said, the sources where we can find out and be educated. I think, I think where you said that we, we shouldn't be narrowing it down. I think we do have to identify where these places are and that people can, you know, be satisfied that they know it's there. I mean, we have to say that, look, you can go online and you will find out that there will be education on there. We can't just say, oh, yeah, somewhere, you know, online there will be education. We have to say it is there. In a sense, we have we have to be we have to identify where these places of education are. But as you say, there have to be a wide source, and there has to be a lot of places where they are. Hopefully, I was going to mention this in my talk, but I'll bring it up now because it's relevant. Education is great, but for education to be productive and not counterproductive, it has to be accurate and it has to be up to date. So, for example, there was an organization in the United States that had an enormous amount of federal funding to teach internet safety education. As of a year ago, their graphical images showed pictures of computers that haven't been used in schools for 10 years. That's the least of the problem. The biggest problem is that their messaging was based on information that hadn't been updated in 20 years. They were going around telling people that there was a serious risk that if you go online, you're going to be sexually abused by a predator. That risk, we have seen through real research, exists but is extremely low and affects a very small percentage of the population. They weren't giving the proper education. Going around talking about bullying as being a major epidemic, not only is that inaccurate, it's counterproductive because if bullying were an epidemic, that means everybody's doing it. And if everybody's doing it, it must be okay. So why shouldn't I do it? Giving accurate education around bullying actually would be helpful, but this counterproductive misinformation that we're seeing from some government-funded research from teachers who are out of date is worse than no education at all. And so I agree with the comments that you need to have a variety of sources. Just as we teach children critical thinking skills, that when you go online, you don't rely on one source. That's Journalism 101. We learned that in our first journalism course. Never rely on one source, including if it's funded by the government or your school, because it may very well be out of date and it could actually be more harmful than helpful. So I agree with peer education. I think the industry is sometimes more up to date. I would look to the NGOs and I would look at a variety of sources and I would independently look at some of the research, whether in the US and Europe from Crimes Against Children Research Center or EU Kids Online, some of the research that's been, do been done in the Middle East. There's some great work being done. Look at that and when you hear the education, make sure that it's education and not misinformation. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think that uh, that points us uh, really to the right direction, uh, and also the evaluation of this, uh, the whatever education we have, how effective are they? I have a final question here from Lucinda. Uh, I wanted to make a point, really. Um, one of the things that I think Matthew touched upon when we're talking about industry and how they can help is one of the things that we do in our day job. So we're an internet safety charity, and we call for clear, prominent, accessible, and timely information from service providers. And I think a really good example of that to flag up here is something that Facebook have done. Um, I sit on Facebook Safety Advisory Board, as does Larry and Anne, who are also in the room. And one of the things that Facebook did was when you go on to update your profile when they made the new inline privacy settings the very first time you went on at each step there was a little um, explanation of what you had to do so this is this is how you're going to change your location and this means this and I think that kind of information is the type of information that service providers can be providing and can be providing really well it's short it's snappy it's on their service it's up to date and it's at the point of use which is something that we as NGOs and schools can't always do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucinda. I think that's very relevant. Um, unless we have a, oh, we have a hand there, uh, and I will take that as the last question for our young panel because we have to move on with our adult panel as well. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh. Hi, good morning. My name is Trevor. I'm from Diplophila from St. Kitts in the Caribbean. Um, I want to thank the young people for being as open and informative as they have been. In an earlier panel, it was mentioned that in an earlier panel, it was mentioned that communicating feelings and emotions on the internet could be an issue. So, I'd just like to ask a question to any of the panelists: um, Do you find issues or do you have challenges communicating emotions or feelings on the internet via chats and so on versus 
face-to-face -face interaction. Do you want to say? Yeah. Um, well, we, we did a survey about, well, with young people, asking them how they communicated online, what they thought about freedom of expression, things like that. And one of the questions we asked was how they interpreted humour and, and sarcasm online. And I think it was from 11 to 18-year-olds, uh, the people who responded to our survey said they do find it harder to um, and identify emotions online. And that 36% um, said they didn't find it harder to, to communicate or to find if people were being sarcastic or making a joke. So, um, yeah, that was what people seemed to be saying, that the majority of people did find it harder, whereas some people didn't. I think, I think your question really highlights the difference between the online and offline world, where these things are completely different, and emotion and expressing emotion, and what you really want to get across in just text, and that kind of plain format, in some cases, is just really hard to identify with. And so I think our survey reflects this kind of distinction between the two worlds, but also said that we need to improve this. We need to make it clearer that our expression online, that our participation in community life and social media sites is more clear and more to the point of what we want to have. Thank you very much, Matthew. And it also highlights there are specific needs for special, uh, special groups who need the internet to communicate, to express their ideas because of the anonymity and um, you know, the opportunity of self-expression self it offers, which is not possible in the physical world. And um, you know, we, we, we know we, we all do that, um, not only for uh, you know, making fun of people or taking risks, but also um, expressing ourselves in a positive way, which is not possible in a physical world. Um, so um, I think uh, we have really uh, had a diverse set of uh, issues covered by our young panelists and um, thanks very much to all of them. Uh, we move to our next session. Um, uh, we will invite our so-called adult panelists to the floor and I will start with um, uh, Savinj. Uh, she is uh, from Azerbaijan and uh, will guide us to, through her thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, I would like to welcome all of you in Azerbaijan on behalf of myself and our organization. As you know, this year has turned as many grand occasions took place in Azerbaijan, and we are surely much honored to be hosting such grand occasion like this forum. Azerbaijan is European charm of the Orient, and I hope that you had the chance to see the beauty of the city kindness and hospitality of the people. Recognizing the importance of this multi-stakeholder policy dialogue and by giving a chance to become a panelist at the forum, I'm glad that I can contribute to its work by representing and speaking for the civil society of Azerbaijan. When we talked about the web that is spread all around the world, the internet, which has become as much part of our daily life as eating, for instance, we cannot meet the fact of the obvious consequences it may have if not using it in the right way, just like not eating the right healthy food. Surely we can say that today children are at a high risk while being affected by the dangerous and harmful internet content and what makes them vulnerable in their dependence from adults, as all children need support, protection in order to gain necessary skills to form and improve their individual capacities. The use of ICATES is rapidly increasing in Azerbaijan, and uh, currently 65% of population are internet users. More than one million people have an account on the Facebook. Children become internet users at very early ages, and uh, in Azerbaijan, what puts children to the vulnerable internet users category is the lack of practice and skills on use of ICATES and incoherent information literacy among the adults. Especially now, when the owning a computer or access to the internet is not a matter of a question, as it's reachable for everyone. As Fidan mentioned earlier, all schools are equipped with computers and internet access, whether in rural or urban areas of Azerbaijan. As you know, Azerbaijan is still in war situation with Armenia, and children from the border regions, especially IDP and refugees, are most vulnerable group among children in Azerbaijan 
because of their emotional state. Empowering children and their parents, educators, in order for them to make the best possible use of information and communication services and technologies is vital and the world of information is literally built up on the internet. Also, the state, the state party is ratifying the Convention on the Rights of the Child, being a unique document as a part of International Human Rights Treaty addressing the child rights, develop national legislations, regulations, and policies. I strongly believe that the multi-stakeholder approach to improving children in the new information and communication uh, environment must pursue. Our organization has implemented a number of successful projects concerning children's and youth development and participation and play a special role in children's well-being in society. Understanding the need for children to access reliable and tested information that can help them develop their capacities, we have presented the first children's website in 2005, which, has, which was especially developed for children. By using our own strategies to raise awareness, we have advocated children's online safety by directly working in communities, empowering children and their parents, educators in schools, in order for them to make the best possible use of communication services. Recently, we have organized a cyber use camp uh, for peer trainers who are now equipped with necessary information skills to train um, their peers on how to use the social networks and will act as multipliers. I'm sure that we cannot achieve anything with the restriction and we have to, friend, to be friendly with children. The only solution is well-organized, well sustainable, and comprehensive education and advocacy. This is what I have experienced. I understand that we have very limited time, so I would like to end my speech here. In the end, I would like to add, I believe that if we talk about children's online safety, we must put the interest and decision of the children first. We cannot exclude children in the process of developing policies concerning them. Children's voices must be heard while making decisions about their lives. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Fedan. Uh, I think you gave us um, a list of things that's happening here in Azerbaijan and um, you know what uh, the government and the enterprises are doing uh, to make the internet safer but lo there are lots of new, you know things that still needs to be put in place and i hope these panels that we are having at igf help uh, the nation and you know uh, other countries who are participating to get these learnings back and you know introduce them in in, in their processes thank you very much um, we will come back if we have questions for her. We will come back um, at the end of the session during the Q&A panel. I will move on to my next panelist sitting right beside me, uh, Larry Magid. Uh, he is the co-director um, of Connect Safely and also the founder of SafeKids.com. And um, so over to you, Larry. I think the two most important things we can do to protect children on the line is number one, to stop patronizing them um, and to stop I hate to use the word lying to them, but spreading misinformation. On the misinformation issue, uh, Anne and I have a very close colleague named David Finkelhor, who is director of the Crimes Against Children Research Center. His organization is funded by the United States Department of Justice. It is staffed uh, by some of the leading researchers at the University of New Hampshire. They review all the literature. Unlike most people who talk about the internet, they actually know what they're talking about. Unlike the article that I wrote in 1994, 1994, I wrote Child Safety in the Information Highway. I'm glad I wrote it, but please don't quote it because it was based on what I knew in 1994. So let's look at statistics as Dr. Finkelhort has wrote. Since the internet has come online, since we did research before the explosion of young people on the internet, and it's very important for the folks for Azerbaijan to listen to this because this is what America has learned in 20 years. Sexual assaults have gone down, not up. Literacy has gone up, not down. Teen suicide has declined, not gone up. Forget bullicide. Fewer teens are committing suicide than committed suicide before the internet. Sexual, risky sexual behavior has gone down, not up. Bullying has gone down, 
Bullying is lower today than it was before the Internet. That's the statistics. I know what you hear. I know what you read. I know you hear about the epidemic. But it is wrong. It is inaccurate. We just had an election where about half the rhetoric was wrong, and Americans needed to make decisions based on accurate information. The same is true in this field. The media has misinformed us. Many governments have misinformed us. Finally, after 20 years, America is beginning to get it right. But we have gotten it wrong for the last 20 years. So it's very important that we not fantasize and imagine risks, but base it on real risk. And I'm not saying there aren't risks. One suicide is tragic. One bullying e episode is, is horrific. One child being sexually abused is, is, is unacceptable. But let's not imagine an epidemic where an epidemic doesn't exist. Look around. Look at young people. Look at how smart they are. Look what's happening just a few hundred miles from here in the Arab world. Yes, I know there are problems. But that revolution, that, that change, that incredible opportunity happened after the uh, development of the Internet, and some would argue because of the Internet. So let's not put our heads in the sand and say, oh, how terrible things are. Things are getting better since the Internet came along. I am so happy that the young people in this panel have said over and over again that one size does not fit all. We cannot patronize our children. I want to end with one little simple uh, analogy. One of the things that we are doing, uh, that Ann and I and, and others are doing in the U.S., is trying to apply a public health model to Internet safety. So in the public health world, they have primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, interventions. And I'm going to give you a public health version of this. Primary education, for example, is about good nutrition, regular exercise, the dangers of tobacco and alcohol. That's the general messages we give to the population. Then there is secondary prevention for people who have a serious risk factor. You know, whether they may get sick and they've been diagnosed, but they're not terribly sick. And then we have tertiary intervention to help people manage diseases. On Internet safety, yes, we need to give all of the children the kind of education that ChildNet has given these very smart young folks from, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> from the UK, and that uh, Save the Children has given these very smart young folks from, from Denmark, and we did, we did not hit them either. <laughs> but, and then there are children who, for a variety of socio-emotional uh, uh, reasons, are at risk, and we need to provide them with a much deeper level of, of, of support. And there are children who sadly have already had serious problems, whether it's sexual abuse or incarceration or parents with serious drug problems, and they need really good intervention. But we need to be smart about it. The analogy I like to use is if you're about to get on a plane to Chicago, you don't need to take malaria medication. If you're about to go to a humid climate, you do. But in America, we used to give malaria shots to everybody going to Chicago, but we failed to give them to the people who are going to the deep, deepest parts of Africa. And we need to be smart about how we do Internet education. And with that in mind, I think we're going to actually be effective. But again, please base your messages on accurate information. And please recognize, as we've seen on this panel, that children are a lot smarter than many adults give them credit for. Um. Thank you very much, Larry. I think uh, that was very inspirational, <laughs> motivating, and maybe uh, uh, will raise issues, um, discussions. Um, I know you wanted to be a bit provocative in some sense, and that's good. Uh, that's what we need. Uh, we need to be hitting the nail right on the head now. I didn't travel 10,000 <laughs> miles to be, uh, you know, to say nothing. <laughs> yes. And, um, so, uh, just one comment here, what you raised is, you know, what I would like to highlight here, risks may be going down, um, incidents may be reported less, or, you know, not happening less, uh, but they're still happening, which you rightly pointed out. Yeah. So, misinforming people, misguiding people will actually not solve those issues, will divert them in the wrong direction, and prevent people from actually using the space that they deserve. So, uh, that point is taken. Um, and I will not preempt the thoughts that my audience may have, so uh, I will come back to questions when we open up. Uh, the next speaker in our list is uh, Susie Henry. Uh, she is the Director of Public Policy at the GSMA. And we all know GSMA is the global, um, you know, uh, it's the, GSM, the association of the GSM uh, mobile phone operators. Uh, so I will let G Susie explain uh, what you are doing right now. 
Thanks, Anjan. I feel a bit inadequate um, as the only uh, representative from industry uh, on the panel. I'm not even on the panel. I'm standing up here, so I'm really standing out. Uh, and just to say, I unfortunately can't represent all of the internet industry, um, but I can talk a little bit about what the mobile uh, phone industry is doing. Uh, the question was, you know, about technology in the digital age. So I want to quickly look at the role of mobile technology in the digital age. And I want to start with saying I think mobile offers a great opportunity to connect, communicate, and innovate. Uh, we've heard from some very distinguished uh, panelists on the youth perspective, and youth are the future of mobile, and mobile, or the internet is mobile going forward. By the end of 2012, there are going to be 2 billion youth around the world. Um, we've done a lot of research around the world uh, outside of the developed countries, and we know that kids are using smartphones there too. This isn't just about uh, you know, privileged kids who have access to this technology. This technology is impacting children in all uh, parts of the world. Um, mobile is playing a very important role in that. Um, we've heard a lot about education. Um, we've seen how tablets are replacing textbooks. Um, but we've also seen uh, innovations uh, such as um, Vodafone in India have developed a SIM-enabled keyboard that's bringing the internet in a very crude way, but bringing it to schools in rural um, parts of India where they never had any connectivity before. Um, we've also heard about how the internet and mobile is empowering social engagement. Um, uh, Larry mentioned the Arab Spring, and I think mobile played a very important role in that as well. But I think another perspective that we can't um, underestimate, and we've heard a lot about it today, is what young people are doing to innovate and change the mobile industry. I think some of the most exciting mobile applications are coming from children uh, and young people. Uh, I saw an example last week um, of a child in New York, I think she was 12 or 13, and she decided after Hurricane Sandy to set up a charging station because a lot of people didn't have electricity. So she came up with the idea to open up her, um, her house for people to come and charge their mobiles and their tablets, and she charged a small amount of money, and that money um, she donated to the Red Cross effort to, to help New Yorkers. Um, so I think, you know, uh, coming from the mobile industry, we can't underestimate how young people are innovating and changing and influencing what the industry needs to do uh, going forward. And I'll just quickly finish off with talking about what the mobile industry is doing as well. Um, you know, one of the things that we have done to take responsibility and help guide uh, this, you know, era of young people in the digital world um, is around, for example, uh, we've developed some guidelines for apps developers. You know, developing an app for an adult shouldn't be the same sort of app that a child has. So we've provided guidance on using mindful language, um, having default off location and personal identity settings, uh, taking age verification into account. Uh, as well. And I think there are lots of examples of what individual operators are doing. Um, I've already mentioned Vodafone in India, but Vodafone have also developed um, an, the Guardian app, which is a fantastic tool for parents and young people. They've done a lot of work uh, around digital parenting and digital education. Uh, but another example is um, a mobile operator in Chile called VTR. Uh, John and I heard them present in Chile, and they're doing really innovative things around youth education. And I think it's important to understand, you know, different countries, different operators have different approaches, but they're really uh, doing their best efforts um, to provide a level of education. Uh, but as we've heard on the debate, you know, industry play just one, one role in that, and it is really a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, and I think, um, you know, the mobile industry is committed to this multi-stakeholder approach. We know we don't have all the answers. Uh, we engage in these debates. Uh, we engage in many other uh, organizations and debates to play our part and, and, and listen to youth and, and respond uh, correctly. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susie. I think uh, you really enlightened us about what uh, the industry is doing uh, or should be doing. And uh, it's great that you mentioned that. It's interesting that you mentioned that um, some of the 
the way people are socializing is driving the industry, it's driving the way they're developing their services, the apps that is being developed. It's coming from how users are using, you know. It's a necessity now. It's young people directing, guiding the development process. I think that's a very important aspect of, of, of this whole, uh, whole thing, which we have to keep in mind. And what would be the industry response to that as accountability? And you have already mentioned things that are being put in place to help, um, you know, uh, protecting children and recognizing their needs uh, and educating them, all the sectors. Thank you very much for that. Uh, you have a question, Olivia? No? Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, with that, I move on to uh, John Carr. Uh, John um, is the expert advisor of eNaxo, and uh, he's um, also a, um, advisor to many international organizations, including ITU. Uh, so, and we have, because we started about seven, eight minutes late, we have time. So take your time. We have um, extended the the whole thing to about five, seven minutes, so yeah. don't feel the, rushed. The problem is we all have another session with, that some of us are speaking in uh, at 11 o'clock. Yeah, but we, so have, <coughs> we have time. Anyway, I mean, I'm, I've spoken enough all week, so uh, I don't feel deprived of uh, public affection or attention. <laughs> um, so I will, I will keep my remarks a lot shorter than perhaps I would otherwise have done. Um, because I know people will have questions and I think it has been an extremely interesting uh, discussion. Can I just say briefly before kicking off, the, the, we just heard Susie speak on behalf of the mobile phone industry. Certainly within Europe, I think it's, uh, I, I don't think I'm, I'm exaggerating to say that amongst the best examples of companies that are actively engaging uh, and putting a lot of effort and money uh, into uh, this whole space of child safety and education and awareness at other mobile phone companies. But I, I want to make a, an additional point about that. I think one of the reasons for that is, in, in contrast to many of the big name companies on the internet, the mobile phone companies, each and every single one of them, are regulated in each national jurisdiction by a nationally constituted, legally founded regulator. And so uh, they have much closer engagement and have had for 20, 30 years since the mobile phone industry was established with government, with uh, regulatory environments in a way that most of the big modern internet companies that are very famous, I don't need to name them, simply haven't. And I don't think, uh, and I think that is undoubtedly, in my view, part of the explanation for why you see big differences between what the mobile companies have done and the speed at which they've responded to things and the speed at which other uh, new technology companies have uh, often responded to events. Um, I can't let Larry's uh, remarks go by without commenting on them. Uh, because, you know, this, we're a double act. Um, uh, nobody is in favor of telling lies. Nobody is in favor of, us, of unreasonable exaggeration. Everybody is in favor of research. But we can't not speak about these things. Uh, and the reason we can't speak, we can't not speak about them, because even though, and this is a welcome fact, the incidence of uh, sexual predators getting hold of children or uh, getting them to uh, do webcam exchanges of indecent images of themselves, even though the incidence of bullying uh, and so on is going down and all of these other things are true, when these things happen to an individual child or within an individual family, the consequences for that child, the consequences for that family are permanent and often catastrophic. So what do you do? You can't pretend that these things don't... It's the same with deaths on the road. It's the same with the possibility of, of being kidnapped by a stranger. Every year since 1945, I think, in Britain, roughly six children have been kidnapped by strangers and generally have ended up dead. Is that a reason why parents shouldn't say to their children, if a stranger comes up in a car, don't get into it? No, it isn't. The, the actual incidence is tiny, but the consequences 
of these things going wrong are gigantic. So we have to find measured and reasonable ways of speaking about them, but we can't not speak about them. And, and I might just make another point, since Larry, Larry is a journalist. Um, we're also, to a degree, beholden to the media in these respects. Now, there's an expression in England um, that you learn in journalism school, if it bleeds, it leads. No newspaper, new, no, no media outlet wants to start uh, the, the, the main news of the day with the following kind of headline. Great news, today on the internet in Britain, no child was harmed, no sexual predator managed to make contact with a child, nothing bad happened, isn't that wonderful? No, that's not the way the media works. So when we as campaigners and lobbyists are faced with the media that we've not constructed, we don't own it, we have to find ways of working with them to get our message across. Now that, isn't not, that doesn't give anybody a license to tell lies or misrepresent the truth or exaggerate things, but it also in a way frames the way in which we have to think about how we get our message across. Because as I said, whatever the, the level of incidence uh, is for the individual families and children, it, the, the consequences are catastrophic. And just a final point on this before perhaps shutting up. Um, if I was the chief executive of a big internet company and my chief operating officer came in to see me one morning and said, John, there's the report. 98% of all of our customers think we are wonderful. 98% of our customers have no complaints have no issues, they understand everything that's going on on our service, they use it well, they use it wisely. How can the, the chief, I would say to my CEO, that's fantastic. It's impossible to improve on 98%. The problem with the internet, however, 2% is a hell of a lot of people. 2% in the case of Facebook is 20 million people, for example, because they have a billion members. 2% in the case of uh, Google Circles is probably, I don't know, 300,000 people. I, they're, they're still about 300 million members, aren't they? So small percentages matter on the internet in a way that perhaps they don't matter in several other environments. And let's be clear, we have responsibilities and obligations to every child, not just most children. We have obligations to reach out to every child. And I agree, I, I think the Larry and Anne's public health uh, analogy or, or model is a very, very good one. The problem with the internet, it's not like you can go and see your doctor and be neatly slotted into one of those three categories. Uh, or even at school, uh, you know, it's not always easy to identify what bit of the spectrum you fit into. This is all happening in a remote environment. That you, When you go into a, a, a technology shop to buy a new computer or buy an iPad or buy a new mobile phone or whatever, you're not made to f uh, sit a test or, or an examination to see how smart you are, how much you know. The companies are quite happy to take your money, but they don't, you know, they don't do any kind of fitness test in advance. And I'm not, by the way, I'm not suggesting they should. But again, it does paint a background to the difficulties and challenges that we face. And to dismiss it all as scaremongering or, or, or exaggeration, I think, doesn't do justice to the motives of the people who are trying to reach out to some of these children in, in difficult circumstances or these families in difficult circumstances. Now, final word really, uh, we heard quite different expressions of opinion by the children uh, from Britain and from Denmark. Uh, they were not identical, they were not uniform. And what this should remind us <laughs> is about the huge variety that there is out there. I, I, I know it's easy to say this, but I, I, I kind of, I get, and I get slightly fed up of saying it, one size does not fit all. We cannot speak about 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds, and 7-year-olds in the same breath as we speak about 3- and 4-year-olds. And, and by the way, uh, last w uh, three weeks ago in Britain, uh, Ofcom, which is our statutory regulator, published the, a new piece of research. This is not done by us. This is not done by the children's organization. This is done by a statutory body. And what they found and what they reported for the first time 
was that I think it was 30% of three and four year old children are now going online through a variety of different media. I think they said 6% of them were going online via an iPad. Now what, what, tell me, what does media literacy mean? How do you educate and make aware three and four year olds who are going on the internet? And yet we have a responsibility to them too. We all, we, all, we, all, we all know that not all families are the same, not all parents have got the same grasp of it, so what do we do? Do we shrug our shoulders and say, well, it's just too bad on those kids? No, only a barbarian would do that. We have a responsibility to try and reach out to all of them. Actually, this will be my last comment. <laughs> um, Sonia Livingston, a couple of weeks ago, gave a very interesting talk based on her research from EU Kids Online. She said that what she's finding more and more is that when she speaks to kids about the internet, they're just bored of the conversation. For them, the idea that this internet thing is somehow out there or different or you know, something that you should talk... For them, it's like the electricity. It's like water. It's always been there. It's part of their life. It's not something separate or different. And part of the point of us convening this workshop to discuss citizenship in a digital era was to make this point that actually this is part of life it's not it's not in a place that's different and we need to get across to children and young people that even though they think they might be anonymous and they, that does encourage them to behave in ways that they might not in real life in truth we all have the the same our obligations to other people don't change just because we're on the internet and any parent or any more particularly any teacher or social worker who doesn't grasp the role that, that the internet plays in young people's lives, in my opinion, cannot be doing their job properly. Or it's very unlikely that they're doing their job properly. And that's why Jutta Kroll is here, and uh, I can see in the, in the front row there. Jutta is running a very, very important project uh, out of Germany, which I'm an advisor to, which is specifically trying to get together materials to help social workers, teachers, people who work with young people, to get, get their heads around just what sort of role the internet is playing in young people's lives. And Jan's waving at me. That's it. Uh, thank you very much, John. Thank you. And I knew that would, there would be a response from you in uh, response to, uh, you know, in, uh, what, uh, to what uh, Larry had previously said. I have to criticize you, Anjan. John was supposed to go in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, was, I was looking forward to that not happening. Oh, okay. okay. No, but uh, but uh, you know, um, kidding apart, uh, what we really wanted to make sure is that what John pointed out, the necessity for considering these issues which surface, and I just want to add to that, saying we are only talking about research, education, that we are in the West. What about the culture, the context in the you know people where we are not even reaching? Uh, look at what's happening in you know the Far East. In Africa, are we bringing all the internet is connecting us all? But are we actually talking about what's the education they are receiving? They are being exposed to the same services that is being developed in the West. So we, I think we need to be conscious of, of all these factors when we discuss this. You know, it's not one sided. Um, I gather we have like uh, five more minutes maximum uh, for question and answer. Uh, if there is anything pending, uh, yes, one from my panel. Anybody from the audience would like to raise their hand? Yes, so I would go with you first and then come back to you, okay? Hello? It was just a remark to Larry. I have been uh, working with uh, bullying for like 15 years. I think it's uh, too narrow. Uh, oh, sorry, I am come from uh, Inaxo and Save the Children. Uh, and my name is John Lang. Uh, I've been, been, been working with uh, bullying for like 15 years. I think it's too narrow to say that it's because of the internet that the bullying pro process has gone down. You, you actually said it at the end. Okay. I made a correlation, but a correlation and causation are two separate things. Okay. I never, ever claimed okay, it had great. anything to do with it. Just yeah. to get that. Thank you. Um, this is actually from the audience. Uh, the lady passed uh, it to me. She didn't have time to translate it. Uh, sh her point is that uh, she has been listening to the uh, to the com uh, to the. Um, discussions and sh uh, of the panel, and she says that no one uh, no one noted about the role of TVs. 
We talked about mobile companies and industries, and no one mentions TV. Yeah. Um, I, I do think that's a very important issue. And in our discussion yesterday, uh, we had a discussion where um, the representative of the European Bro Broadcasting Federation presented a very uh, unique challenge where we have an amalgamation of traditional TV and smart TV where internet is approaching our home through the TV and in most countries the television the media is quite regulated you know there are regulations what they can show the timing the content but when we have the internet reaching us through the TV how do we deal with it so and definitely that's a point that we need to also address in discussions like this and they're definitely included we didn't have a, a representative of the media here but definitely they are part of the discussions thank you No more questions? Uh, I, yes, Rebecca, maybe the final, final comment. Or is it a question or a comment? Okay. It's just a really quick comment. I mean, um, me and Matthew were discussing this earlier, and it's come up in the workshop that we run, that it needs to not be fear. I mean, people were saying that um, we're children are vulnerable online, and I think a lot of young people aren't vulnerable. We're digital natives. We know what's happening. We just need to not have the fear struck into us. If you're teaching someone to cross the road, you don't put the fear into them. You give them advice. You say, look left, look right. The same needs to be said for the internet. You need to not make people be fearful of it. It's a tool that will impact our lives for, for as long as we live. And it's ever evolving. But we don't need to be made fearful of it. We don't need to be scared of what's happening. We need to just embrace it and be able to use it properly. Great way. I think that's, that's really, uh, uh, you know, it, it's very fitting in the context of our discussion. Uh, but. Having said that, I would also just say that it's not a technology, uh, sorry, a technique of uh, fear mongering or scaring, but alerting to the risks. You know, that's different. You know, just saying that, you know, if you do this, this might be the implication. Uh, you need to aware, be aware of what the risks are. If you are not told about the risks, if you just rely on you being resilient and learning from your mistakes, that's not correct. I think, uh, what, but what you have already said is, you know, letting you access and go on board is definitely the way to go, but it should be a balanced approach. It's not never one-sided. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's the final, final comment uh, that we had in our session. Uh, thanks to all the people who are here, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming, and all our panelists, young panelists, and our adult panelists, thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you.